Welcome to the Impact Multiplier CEO Podcast. If you're a chief executive, or if you think like one, and you want to create exponentially greater impact, then this show is for you. My name is Richard Metcalf, founder of X Quadrant. I coach some of the most successful and impressive CEOs and executive teams on the planet and help them achieve extraordinary results. And no matter how successful you've been in the past, there's always a whole new level of impact available to you. So if you're ready to play a bigger game than ever before, I invite you to join us and become an Impact Multiplier CEO. What do you do if you have a sense there's not enough ownership in your leadership team? What if people are not taking enough responsibility or just not going the extra mile when you really think they need to? Welcome to Season 3, Episode 3 of the Impact Multiplier CEO Podcast. I'm Davina Stanley, and as, a, as usual, I'm here with Richard Medcalf. Hi, Richard. Hi, How Davina. How are you today? I'm, uh, I'm really well. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, this topic. Um, uh, at the time of recording, um, give a little trade secret here, we're recording this in the time of the US elections, and uh, we're trying not to think too much about that, I think, today. So we'll just try to focus in on uh, our little bubble of the world and not worry too much about all the things going on around us. <laughs> other kinds of leadership, right? Political leadership, well, focus on go. business leadership. How about that? Let's, let's yeah. see, exactly. Let's stay in the nice, safe world of, um, of executive teams. <laughs> I think that's a very, very wise thing to do. So let, let's jump in, shall we? What does it mean not to see ex- ownership in an executive team? Well, when I speak with uh, CEOs or other, other business leaders, they'll, they'll often complain about, you know, there's not enough commitment to hitting targets. Um, there's perhaps a sense of blaming, like if people don't hit their objectives, they'll blame other people, blame other parts of the organization. Uh, there might be a bit of a lack of initiative uh, around uh, things that are not due, not related to the leaders, the sub leaders specific function. Um, overall, it's often that leaders feel that sometimes they have to step in to sort things out in their functions in the business, um, things that they see aren't happening and that their leader is not stepping up to do. And overall, I liken it to, you know, when you go to a restaurant and um, um, everyone agrees to pay their part of the bill <laughs> and um by the, and you're the one who's kind of booked the table so everyone pays their bit and the waiter comes to you and tells you that there's a bit left over that no one has yet paid and you have to reach into your own pocket to kind of close that gap that's the feeling often that, that a leader will have it's like oh my team's all, they've all done their thing kind of but we still haven't quite done the close the loop to really get where we want to get to so is it that they don't have that holistic view in the same way that the leader does? They're just not taking responsibility for the whole picture. They're really very just focused on their own piece. Is, is that the key thing that you see as the biggest challenge there? Um, yeah, I think sometimes leaders were diagnosed it in different ways. Uh, one leader was like, well, this person just seems to be very much stuck in that this is the way we've always done it um, and it's working mm-hmm. fine. So why do I need to change? Sometimes people will say, yeah, they're just not focused on the details enough. They leave things, things fall through the cracks. They don't seem to mind. Um, you know, otherwise, it's, yeah, they're, they're really, really focused on getting the, hitting their own numbers. But as soon as they have to provide resources or attention to things which are not going to drive their own targets, they don't mm-hmm. seem that interested. There can be various, there can be various ways this shows up, I think. Mm. Um, and so... Yeah. Is it a bit surprising that that's happening at the really senior levels of companies then? Well, this is often what I try to explain to, um, to execs because yes, right? Um, when a leader complains, oh, you know, this person, they, they're not, they don't know how to take ownership. Well, can go, well, this leader's risen up the ranks to where they are now. Generally, you do that by being a safe pair of hands and being able to take ownership for things which are given to you. Right, so that's quite interesting, right? You start, you start to think, well, does that mean that the lack of ownership that's going on here, is that as much about you, the senior leader, or at least mm. about the dynamic currently going on? It's not just you, it's them, it's the company, it's the team. 
you know, is, is there something going on about in that current system? Mm. It's, perhaps it's more about that than about the, the actual leader. So that leader probably is somebody who knows how to accept responsibility and, and take ownership, mm. but something right now is not working. So incentives of some sort, incentives, relational mm. incentives or financial incentives or just other it practical could, factors perhaps. Yeah, well, we will get, we can get into some of those. It can be incentives, but incentives don't always solve all the issues, right? We know plenty mm. of people who have full, who are really taken ownership of things, not because they're going to be given a huge bonus for delivering it, but because they feel it's theirs to to do. To do, yeah, yeah. I guess in incentives, I'm also thinking about you know relationships can be an incentive. I want to support mm. that person or encourage them or you know have other kinds of incentives too, not just not just the financial because they're definitely limited, aren't they? Mm. And and there's there's another issue that's going on here, which uh, which is really that when you're talking within an executive team, especially the sense of ownership. It's a bit of new territory in a way for everybody concerned. Mm -hmm. It can be new territory for the senior executive because actually um, there's a question, am I owning this or are they owning this? If we own it, then we're owning it and they're not owning it, right? <laughs> um, and so often we say, well, how are we going to actually let this person take ownership for this object? Because if I'm keeping the reins, if I'm holding the reins, if I'm making the decisions, if I'm fundamentally accountable, then perhaps they're never going to take ownership. So that's one side of the dynamic that as a leader, there's a new shift in you, but also for your functional leader within the team, um, there's also a change. They've probably risen up by, by delivering on their functional roles against very clear targets when you become part of the business leaders of an organization and you're in a team of peers who are all specialists in different functional areas then you're being asked to no longer just take responsibility for your functional uh, role but to start to be an owner of the business as a whole to start to have that sense of accountability and commitment to the cross-functional initiatives and that is also a shift which many leaders are not being prepared for they, they know how to take responsibility for, for marketing initiatives but taking responsibility for the overall health of the business mm -hmm. in all the other departments mm -hmm. in the culture mm -hmm. that's a different that's new ground it really requires them to to use a lot of different sorts of skills, doesn't it? They can't rely on their technical skill anymore. They've actually got to rely on their leadership skill, don't they? Because yeah. otherwise, they can't ask the questions to add value. How right. do you? How does a marketing person ask somebody in accounting, mm. you know, a question that's really helpful to tease out the issue and, and further a discussion when they're not an accountant? Right. So there's all sorts of ways in which people have to stretch, aren't they? Exactly. Mm, and, and so actually, we, we will deal with that question of the functional mm, side in our next mm, uh, episode, because mm, I think it's mm, such a key one. Um, mm, but I think even in teams where you, those, that, the, the functional side is not the problem, uh, you know, either if it's in, within functional teams, it's like lower levels from the organization, there can still be a lack of ownership um, yeah. at any level. Um, yeah. But you definitely also do see it at the executive level. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are some very practical things as a leader you can do to, to, um, to increase that sense of ownership amongst people. Well, that's excellent news. Excellent news. Why don't you share with us a couple of ideas to help us with that? So, okay. So the first point is I would like to um, give this illustration to leaders. Imagine that, you know, you were and having dinner one night and um, the door rings and uh, you go and answer the door and somebody shoves a newborn child into your arms oh. and says, own this, have right. this, and walks off. Okay, okay, you got this baby. Now, obviously, as human beings, we're probably not going to just, like, abandon it, We'd probably, but we'd probably not necessarily want to, like, take on the responsibility for this random baby that's just been shoved into our arms and look after it and nurture it, it and grow years. it for 20 exactly. years <laughs> right probably we might you know unless it's unless it's like a 
you know, a God-given gift for us in this moment of life, you know, and that's exactly what we needed. It might well be, okay, well, we need to pass this on to, to the authorities or we're going to do something about it, right? However, if you have a baby, right, even if you didn't, weren't expecting it, then your sense of ownership and your sense of commitment to that baby is totally different, right? You're going to uh, do whatever it takes for yeah. that child generally right so yes yes so um the point is that almost telling people to take ownership of something is 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 wrong right you can't yeah. make people take ownership of something you can simply create the conditions for them to take ownership right so you can't give them ownership they have to they have to take it they have to want yes. it and, and it's much easier to ask someone to take on something or get, throw them a challenge, isn't it, than to entice them to think they want to take it. Mm. Right. That's yeah. quite and, an art, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So I talk about push and pull. I say as leaders, we have, is, you know, we have the ability to push, the ability to pull from, from other people. So push, many leaders are great at push. It's communicating expectations, mm -hmm. uh, telling them what they require right, or what's needed. Uh, trying to sell my vision, right? I'm trying to persuade, I'm trying to convince. I see all the time my clients, they're very powerful, very experienced people. They're great at that very often. Um, but, and push is great because it, is, it provides clarity. But pull, which is about building common ground, listening, understanding the other person's perspective, finding out what's important to them, what they think, um, what they would do, what they see the issues are. That's what builds ownership. It's mm. when you pull from other people, right? When you draw it out from them. So how do you do that, right? How do you create more of a pull model? Because as you pull mm. from people, you will increase ownership. Um, the first one is making agreements, okay? I mean, this is really all about... Um, getting people to, to say what they want to do, right? Like, how do you want to do this? Um, if you have, uh, let's say, you know, let's say there is an initiative that, that, that you think needs to happen in the business. Now you can come along to your meeting and say, look, we've got a problem with, you know, churn, we need to do a customer retention campaign. You know, I think we need to hit these points, blah, blah, blah. You know, marketing, can you take this on or, whoever it is, customer success, take this on. Then suddenly that, you know, the person has received it because they got to have to do it, you're the boss. But the sense of ownership for, is that the right approach? Is that the right target? Is it the right time frame? Do I believe it's doable? Do I have the resources? You know, there's no ownership around all of that. It's just something they have to do. And therefore it's very easy then to go, well, you didn't give me the resources you didn't give me the right time frame this was not you, you're setting yourself up for for that conversation whereas if you were to say look um yeah this is what i observe that our churn is way too high you know what do you think you know we should do about this and you start to draw out from them well you know i think that it'd be great if we ran a um a customer re-engagement campaign okay well, what do you think that would look like well, I have to, have, to, have to talk to my team, but it could be around these kind of areas. Okay, that sounds good. What's, um, you know, what would you need to have, make that happen? Uh, what's the time frame for that? Um, I might need to negotiate around that. You know, that time frame, it's, it's really not going to help us get where we need to be by the end of the year. What would it take to accelerate that? And so what you're doing is you're helping them build, um, but agreeing with them, the outlines of what they would like to do to solve that problem. You're also allowing them to frame it quite a bit, aren't you? You're actually drawing on their expertise rather than st standing on their toes in a way, yeah. you know, rather than saying, here's a problem, go fix it. You're actually demonstrating by asking them that you're interested in their value that they're adding. It's much yeah. more collaborative, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So I think this idea of co-creation is really mm. important. And often we think we're co-creating when basically we're telling people, so I would ask, I'd try to flip it. I would get them to basically co-create, like help them come up with the basic themes and, and the lines of the action plan. And then you by asking questions and perhaps suggesting some things can perhaps shape it, right? 
but with the feeling that it basically feels like theirs with a few of your thoughts rather than yours with a few of their thoughts. Yes, so getting that balance right and allowing them to add as much value as possible. And I guess also taking the burden off you as the, as the key leader as well, right? Yeah. So it's, it's um, I think that sounds like a really nice way to do it. Nice is not the right word. Effective is a much better word. Very powerful, actually. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's powerful because as, as people, once we, once we commit to something mm. that we have come up with, then it's very easy to hold people accountable to that because mm -hmm. because it's like well you said you you know you i didn't tell you to do this you agreed that it would be the right thing to do you commit the, committed to it and so you've taken responsibility for that and so if you're now coming back and saying um that you didn't f you didn't follow up on your own commitments then does that mean that we don't have a basic have relationship of trust, right? Like we can't function if I can't trust you to do what you say. Obviously, it's it's harder for you to hold people accountable around things that you've told them to do that they haven't really, really bought into. And they've just, because they're always going to find reasons. But you said, look, I, I gave you, I didn't force you into anything. This was your plan. Cunning. Uh, Little. Cunning. <laughs> yeah, cunning. Oh, don't actually. That's funny. Over breakfast this morning, we, I was uh, instructing my children in the art of uh, blackadder. So, um, <laughs> um, so blackadder and queen. We're learning a lot yeah, about your house. Yeah, oh yes, you're going to get it. Yeah, you can get into it all. Um, the question is, do you do that in English or French? Uh, blackadder's got to be in English, I think, for the full <laughs> <the> impact. <laughs> <laughs> um oh dear. yeah so anyway um actually there you go i'm i will do a future season of the multiplier podcast where i will um well i will have a black adder quote for every um every episode and probably half oh the world will have no idea what i'm talking about and the other half <laughs> will warm to me immensely um so um so yes yeah, so we're, we're talking about um yes yeah, so our cunning plans about um about really help creating ownership <coughs> but through co-creation and i think the other place to think about this is in meetings mm -hmm. because <clears throat> excuse me in meetings we uh we often table an issue communicate almost immediately our thoughts about how to deal with this issue <laughs> ask people whether they've got any other ideas and assume that silence means uh no that sounds great you know i'm on board isn't that it's interesting isn't it and somebody said to me once that the leader should always speak last yeah and exactly. that is i i've personally found that to make a, a very big difference in my own team when i when i hold back and and just let everyone else speak first it makes the world of difference to the tone of yeah, the conversation it, and the it, collaboration it, and you know the sense of of ownership too of, of what people are taking on mm. yeah if you raise the issue and say what can we do about this or what do you think mm -hmm then you're pulling from people and mm, you're co-creating mm. once again. So the one of the ways I, I go around, uh, one of the ways I help leaders look at that is to say, yeah, first of all, raise the topic, invite responses, speak at the end, assume that silence means that people disagree rather than they agree. Um, right. And even ask people very clearly to signal whether they are fully on board, have a few questions or reservations, or actually a negative. One thing I've used with teams is little little cards, green cards for yes, red cards means I've got a problem with this, and yellow means I've got a few questions, need to think about this. It's not the same as being totally uh, a blank piece of paper and um, inviting people to co-create everything, but sometimes, you know, even when you've got to move fast and you mean to make some decisions, mm -hmm. taking two seconds for people to hold up their card allows you to really identify around the table. Okay, this person really has got a question, a problem. Let me just, let's just take a second to address that. It's either a valid issue that we want to deal with or we go, okay, well, are you prepared to support the initiative even if, even if you don't quite agree? Is it and a material, it, is it a deal breaker? Is it a deal breaker? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's quick. That's much quicker than going around to vote and hands up and counting. The colour on a card would make that much more visible. I think that that sounds like a practical idea. 
Yeah, it's, it's instantaneous. And um, what you find is that um, when people give you, when you get a whole sea of green cards, there's a real sense of, yeah, we're there, we, we can go forward, we can move fast. When there's quite a few yellows, it's like, okay, we need to slow down perhaps on this one. What are the questions people have got? What are the risks people see? And when people, you know, people um, don't buy in if they don't weigh in. Right, people don't buy in if they don't weigh in. I think that's John Maxwell has that uh, saying, yeah. and it's a great one because uh, the question you have to ask yourself is: Did everybody get to weigh in on this decision? And if they yes. didn't really get heard, it's very hard for them to feel any sense of ownership of it. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes good sense. That makes absolute sense. Look, that's probably a, a great sense, a great time to pause, I think, on this one. There's been lots of really great ideas there. So I think that's that's really helpful. Um, and look, next time, I think I gave the cat away a little bit too early, but next time we're going to focus on uh, what to do when everyone's focused on their functional silos. Um, Richard, have you got anything you want to add before we wrap? Yeah, the question I would ask you is how important is ownership for you? Are you ready to let go of the reins uh, to empower people to, to take this on? It's as much about you as it's about them. And it's better to be 60% right with 100% ownership than to be 100% right and only have 60% ownership. In other words, even if your idea is not, even if the other person's idea isn't perfect, if it's good enough and they totally own it, that's a way more scalable and impactful approach than trying to force your perfect ideas on people who don't feel any sense of ownership around that. Fantastic. Okay, look, that, that's a, a great place to finish, I think. Thank you for all those good ideas. They're fantastic. Um, now, if anyone does want to go to um, to get the show notes, you can get them at xquadrant.com forward slash season three, episode three, and you can get the details about all of the podcasts at um, xquadrant.com slash podcast. So thanks so much, everybody. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Bye everybody. Goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Now let's talk about you. When you're in top leadership, when you're in the biggest role of your career, who supports you at a deep level as you lead others? Who helps you multiply your impact and get to the next level? If you're ready to learn more about our content, our coaching, and our community, then visit us at xquadrant.com.